Welcome to the Concepts of Faith broadcast. This program is dedicated to teaching you how to put the Word of God to work so that it will make a positive difference in the everyday circumstances of your life. This is the principle of the law of faith. Whosoever shall say, believe, doubt not his heart, believe what he's saying will come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Notice it didn't say he'd have what he prayed, didn't say he'd have what, what God wanted him to have, and if it was God's will, it happened, but he says he shall have whatsoever he saith. If he believe, if he doubt not his heart, if he believes what he's saying will come to pass. In other words, if you're fully persuaded, it'll come to pass. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Now, we're, we're going to deal with calling things that are not. Go there with me to uh, Romans, the third chapter. In Romans, the third chapter, Let's begin with verse 12 here, and we'll, we'll lay some foundation. Verse 13 says, For the promise that he should be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Now that phrase, the righteousness of faith, is important because what Paul said in Romans 10, when he said, The word is nigh thee, it is even the righteousness which is a faith says. And he tells you what the righteousness of faith would say. It says, The word is nigh you, it is in your mouth and in your heart. In other words, he's telling you how to get it from the pages of this book into your heart where it can do something in your life. Not enough just to know about it. Now, when you come down to verse 16 here, notice it says, Therefore it is a faith that it might be by grace. In other words, it wasn't through the law that Abraham was going to be heir to the world. Now, what does it mean to be heir to the world? Heir to the things that God has given us in this life. There's some things you won't enter into until the afterlife, but, but you see, so many people have put off all the good blessings of God until we get to heaven. Well, there's some things that you won't need when you get to heaven. Gas won't be $1.60 a gallon when you get to heaven. I mean, you need that here and now. You need finances for here and now. And, and to preach the gospel, it takes finances. And it, it, it takes money to get the gospel around the world. And it takes money to build these buildings. And they're necessary. Somebody said, well, why are we building all these big buildings, you know, if Jesus is coming right away? Well, we'll only be in heaven seven years. We come back, we'll still use these buildings. Now, what we see here is... is in verse 16, he says, it is a faith that it might be by grace. The reason for that statement is the only way you can enter in to the grace of God is through faith. You can't get there any other way. You cannot enter into the grace of God through your good works. It's only through faith. Say it with me. I enter into grace, enter into grace. through faith. Through faith. <coughs> Now notice what he goes on to say. Therefore it is a faith that it might be by grace to the end. The promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is the law, but to that also which is the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. God taught Abraham to call things that are not as though they were. Now, see, this is not some far out uh, idea that's somebody's theory. This is God's idea. This is the way God taught Abraham faith. Now, let me give you just a little background. I'm sure you're familiar with it, but it'll help us clarify this thing. When Abram was 75 years old, God spoke to him and told him he's going to have a worldwide ministry. He didn't even have a promised child, and he said, great nations will come out of you, and his wife was barren. 24 years he had the promise and no manifestation of it. God appeared to him after he had the promise for about 11 or 12 years and said, and, and here's what Abraham said to him. Well, first of all, when, when he talked to Abram, he said, if you'll separate yourself from Lot, after you're separated from Lot, he said, now look toward the east, the west, the north, and the south, and everything you see, I'm going to give it to you. In other words, you can have everything you can see. Now, that was a physical land. We understand that. That was the promised land of Israel. Our promised land today are promises of this new covenant. This is our promised land. And 
this principle is still available today and it's still the same. Everything you can see on the inside, you can live the reality of it out in your life. But you have to see it on the inside before you can live out the reality of it. You must be fully persuaded. See, Abraham was fully persuaded. Right here it goes on to say, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years of age, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what God had promised he was able to perform. Now you notice he's talking about Abraham here. His name was Abram at first. When God appeared to Abram in the 15th chapter, he said, Abram said to him, Lord God, what will thou give me seeing I go childless? Now think about it. He's told him, I'm going to give you everything you can see. And he said, what will you give me seeing I go childless? Had the promise, 11 years or 12, no manifestation of it. But he let the cat out of the bag, as we'd say here in Arkansas, when he said, seeing I go childless. He told him he'd have everything he'd see, but he can't see himself with a child. So he led him out and showed him a star. He said, tell the stars, if you be able to number them, so shall thy seed be. Trying to create an image in him. <clears throat> now, when you find uh, that in the 17th chapter, he is 99 years old. No manifestation of this promise that God has given him. But then God changes his name to Abraham, which means the father of a multitude or father of nations. Now think about it. Here's a man that had the incorruptible seed of God's word for 24 years and no manifestation of it. Now you have to realize that there was not a whole lot taught about faith in the Old Testament. You either believed God or you didn't. He couldn't turn over there and read Romans 10, 17 and find out that faith cometh by hearing. And he sure couldn't find out that the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth. And that, well, yeah, he could have if he'd have read the Old Testament. It's in the Old Testament. But you see, he didn't hook up on it. Now here you find that uh, when, when he is 99 years old, God appeared to him and said, I have made you the father of many nations. Made, past tense. He didn't have the promised child. Now for those people that say, well, you, you can't say anything that's not already in manifestation. If you do that, you're just lying. But be careful you calling God a liar because he called Abraham the father. I have made you. That's past tense, isn't it? I've made you the father of many nations. Now what happened? When, within a 12-month period after he changed his name, See, he was about 100 years old when the promised child was born. Now, he's 99 when God changed his name. Now, think about it. Abram, his name was changed to Abraham, and he had to tell everybody, my name is Abraham. And faith cometh by hearing. Now, in those days, they knew what names meant. They knew, he said, I'm the father of a multitude. And what did God do? He instigated his own law of faith to cause this to come to pass. Whosoever shall say, believe, doubt not in his heart, believe what he saith, and it come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. You see it in operation in the Old Testament. And here, within a year, after he changed his name, what, well, actually what God did, he forced Abraham to say what God said about it. Can you see that? I mean, once he changed his name, he had to say what God said. <laughs> and there, wasn't no, there wasn't no question about it. I mean, if God changed your name, your name has changed. So when he started saying, I'm the father of nations, that's what it meant. Within a year, the promised child was born. Now, folks, this is God's way of calling things that are not as though they were. Now, now go with me over to 1 first, uh, first Corinthians. I want to show it to you. Apostle Paul touches on this again in a little different way. And there's some other things involved here, but I think you can see this as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27 and 28. But God has chosen 
the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world and things which are despised has God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. Now think about this. God chose things that are not. Now what's that mean? Things that are not manifest, things that are not in the natural realm. He chose spiritual forces that are capable of changing or bring into manifestation things that are not yet manifest. He chose things that are not to bring to naught things that are. In other words, if you can see your problem, if it's in the natural realm, if it's physical, if it's finances, I mean, if there's lack, God has a method of changing that, and it's called calling things that are not. You don't call what's there. It's already there. You call the thing that is not there. If you have lack, First of all, be obedient to the Scripture. When you gave in the offering while ago, you set in motion a promise of God. Give, and it shall be given unto you. So now your confession should not be that I have given, and it shall be given unto me. Your confession should be, I have given, and it is given unto me. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, men given to my bosom. I proclaim that I sow bountifully, and I reap bountifully. And my God has made all grace abound toward me, that I having all sufficiency of all things, and I do abound to every good work. What are you doing? You're calling things that are not. And if you're not careful, some well-meaning Christians will say, well, I know you're just lying. No, that's not lying. That's applying the principles of God's idea of the principles of the law of faith and how they work. Whosoever shall say. There's no power released without saying. Words produce power. Quirks work. <laughs> I mean, there's power released. The ability of God. When you say what God said, you're releasing the same power that God released in the beginning. If you believe, if you doubt not in your heart. You see what I'm talking about? But now, you see, your, your carnal mind will fight against that if you get it renewed. That's why you need to, to confess the Word of God. And, and especially if there are certain areas that you have problems with, if it's physical, if it's financial, uh, if it's social, if it's a, a problem on your job, find uh, places in the Scripture. Find you a Scripture for it and begin to confess that Scripture and, and proclaim it over and over and over and over. Um, and it, it'll change situation. What you do is you call things that are not as though they were until they are. Now, I want to read this 28th verse again. He has chosen the base things of the world, things which are despised. Now, let me stop there just a minute. I've heard people say, oh, I just despise this faith and confession stuff. It just puts you in bondage. You can't even say you're sick when you're sick around these faith folks. <laughs> well, that's what it said right here. God chose things that are despised. <laughs> He has chosen things uh, that are despised as God chosen. Three times in these two verses, it said God chose this method. Did you notice not one place in there did it say, Brother Copeland chose this or Brother Caps chose this method? God chose this method. This is God's instruction of how to operate in the principle of the law of faith. Chose things which are not yet manifest. Let me add that things that are not manifest, to bring to naught things that are manifest. Why? Because when you speak words based on the authority of the Word, now don't misunderstand me. You can't just go out here and say anything you want to say and not have any Scripture for it. I know I bought some property up in North Central Arkansas in 1980, me and another fellow, and we had some lean years there where, I mean, it was tight. I mean, they was, uh, we had to call things that were not as though they were. And, uh, but I found me a scripture in the Bible. It's, it's on top of Prior Mountain. And, uh, and that sc scripture said, uh, Lord, through your favor, you have made my mountain to stand strong. 
And I started standing on my deck and, and, and voicing it out to the property. Lord, through your pleasure, you've made my mountain to stand strong. And I'd quote the Word of God and proclaim abundance when it looked like you, you couldn't borrow enough money to, to, to stay in the business. And, and I want you to know it worked just like God said. Every piece of property I bought and sold in the last 20, 25 years, I talked to it, and it obeyed me. Almost every piece of property I've sold, I did the same thing to it. See, in, in the 17th chapter of Luke, the apostles said, saying, Lord, increase our faith. Now listen to what Jesus said. He said, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say unto the sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root, be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. He didn't say God, it obey God, he said it obey you. Now they're wanting Jesus to give them more faith. Now, you know, after two or three times of him saying, oh, ye of little faith, they thought, let's just have him give us more faith. <laughs> Wouldn't that be good? But you see, not one scripture in the Bible said, pray and God give you more faith. Faith cometh by hearing the word. You'll come more quickly by hearing your voice speak and proclaim what God's word said. And uh, so he said, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, and I mentioned this in the morning session, it bears repeating here, that mustard plant is a plant that you cannot hybrid. You cannot cross-pollinate it with any other plant. In other words, Jesus was saying, if you had faith, it won't change. If you're fully persuaded, if you have faith that will not change, you would say to the obstacle in your path, the problem that you're facing, whether it's a, a fig tree, I mean a, a sycamine tree or a mountain of, of debt, say to it, be plucked up, be planted in the sea. You'll never hinder me again as long as I live. You hear me saying it, I say you're removed in Jesus' name. Well, it wasn't removed when you said that. But Jesus said he shall have. He shall have. If he believes, if he doubts not in his heart, and if he believes what he says will come to pass, what he is saying. And there's something there we need to investigate. Not just what he said to the mountain, not just what he said to one thing, but believe that everything that you speak out of your mouth will come to pass. In other words, don't speak things you don't believe. Now, this is one of the missing links in the faith connection. People speak things that they don't believe. You know, we've all done it down through the years, uh, talk all kinds of foolishness, you know, because the devil inspired the uh, language of, of unbelief, and our carnal mind picked up on it. You know, we said, tickle me to death, laughed, I thought I'd die, die and to go, going to die if I don't. Well, that's not scriptural talk, because the scripture said laughter doeth good like a medicine. Nobody in here taking medicine to die, is there? <laughs> no. The doctor wrote you a prescription, and you got home and read on the bottle, and it said take three of these a day till they kill you. What would you do with it? <laughs> You'd throw them as far as you could. So to be scriptural about it, if we laughed, we ought to say we laughed till we knew we'd live forever. <laughs> well, laughter does good like a medicine. Praise God. Calling things that are not as though they were. Now, there's always somebody saying, yeah, but now, Brother Caps, here's the way I believe it. I just believe you have to say it like it is. You say it any other way. You're just lying about it. But now you just follow that fellow and see if he believes that all the time. He'll say that in church. You know, people sometimes, and, and especially in religions, religious churches, they get religious-minded. But when he goes home, that's not what he believes. But because he goes out home to feed his dog, and his dog is not there. He goes out on the back porch, or, and, and, he, and his dog is gone. That fellow will stand right there on the back porch and call his dog until he comes. Here, Pooch, or here, Rover, whatever his name is. And he'll call that dog till he comes. Now, what's he doing? He's calling things that are not. And here's the way he'll call them. He'd say, here, Pooch, and Pooch is not here. He's yonder somewhere. Don't know where, Pooch. But now, when he gets in church, bless God, you've got to say it like it is. And if you're sick, you've got to just say you're sick. Now, don't misunderstand me. There's no power in denying sickness. 
Now, this is one of the things that happened in the early 70s. People got the idea. See, when you, when you teach these things, sometimes you have to learn what people uh, thought you said. And they got the idea that if you're sick, you've got to say you're not sick. No, that's, there's no power in denying sickness. We don't deny that sickness exists. We deny its right to exist in our body because we've been redeemed from the curse and by his stripes you were healed. Sickness may be a present fact in your life, but it's not the truth. The truth is by his stripes you've been healed. But now until you get the manifestation of it, you're sick. <laughs> Are you listening to me? So if you're trying to convince somebody that you don't hurt when you, in fact, are hurting all over, that's not a confession. That's a lie. <laughs> now, see what I'm talking about? We don't deny that sickness exists, but we just don't talk about the problem. In other words, the more you talk about your problem, the more you'll believe in it. I mean, the, the more you talk sickness, the more you believe in sickness. Well, you know, we always have the flu this time of year. We always get it for anybody else. I don't doubt it. <laughs> you call for it. You were expecting it. Now, see, we just read what a medical doctor said about this. He said, you, uh, if you believe you're going to be sick, you get sick because there's power in believing. But now, this, this fellow standing right there and call his dog, and if I walked up and tapped him on the shoulder and said, why are you lying about your dog? Well, he'd think I was crazy. <laughs> but yet, he thinks I'm foolish if I, when I'm sick, I'm saying, thank God by the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. Thank God my body is well. I call my body well in the name of Jesus. Every organ and tissue of my body functions in the perfection which God created to function. I forbid any malfunction in my body. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in me and quickens my mortal body with the life and the wisdom of God. And here's a good one you can add to it, especially if you have cancer. You know, they have a, a, a method now of implanting radioactive seeds in certain cancer cells to destroy them. Sometimes they leave them in there, and sometimes they just leave them in there 24 hours and radiate that and destroy that cancer cell. My Bible says the Word of God is incorruptible seed. Incorruptible seed. There's life in every Word of God. Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The Word of God is incorruptible seed. It will annihilate cancer and sickness and disease. So the confession should be that the Word of God, the incorruptible seed of God's Word that abides within me, radiates the life of God to every fiber of my being, annihilating cancer and every disease and every form that tries to inhabit my body. Say that until you believe it. He shall have whatsoever he saith, if he believe and doubt not his heart. Now, does that agree with the Word of God? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The word of God is incorruptible seed. God sent his word and healed them. That incorruptible seed of God's word, if it abides in you, it'll radiate the life of God and annihilate that cancer, annihilate that tumor. Now, don't misunderstand me. If the doctors have got you on something, add this to it. Add this to it. Thank God for what medical science can do but do something scriptural about it. Proclaim the Word of God. That incorruptible seed of God's Word will radiate the life of God throughout your body and annihilate sickness and disease. I'm convinced that by the confession of the Word of God and, and getting the Word of God on the inside of you, confess that your immune system grows stronger day by day. I speak life to my immune system. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in me and quickens my immune system with the life and the wisdom of God which guards the life and health of my body. I, I'm convinced that by the Word of God and the confession of the Word of God, you can build your immune system, into your immune system an anointing of God that will eliminate sickness and disease in a natural manner. But it takes time. And you must be fully persuaded of it. See, it's based on the authority of the Word of God, calling things that are not as though they were. 
Now you see Jesus operated in this in all of his ministry. But yet, if, if, if you don't study the Word of God with that thought in mind, you won't pick up on it. I appreciate so much you joining us for the Concepts of Faith broadcast. Now I'm holding in my hand uh, two CDs. It's called Calling Things That Are Not. It's entitled Calling Things That Are Not As Though They Were. Uh, now this is a new item for us. Uh, in fact, I think this is the first time we've offered it on television. It's for $15 plus $4 postage and handling. Now, in this uh, two CDs, you will get some information concerning the principle of calling things that are not as though they were. Now, somebody said, well, what, Brother Cap, what do you mean calling things that are not? I mean calling things that are not manifest. Now, you only get two verses into Genesis till you find God calling things that are not. He looked out and he saw darkness and he said, light be, and light was. Well, somebody said, I understand that, Brother Cap, because he's God. Well, read a little further. He said, let us make man in our image and our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl there, over the cattle, over all the earth. See, God created man to have dominion on this planet. He expected us to have dominion the same way that he had dominion, through words. Now, it, there is no clearer Bible principle in the Word of God than the principle of calling things that are not as though they were. You see Jesus do it in all of his ministry. You see Jesus one day, he went to sleep in the back of the boat, and he had said to them, we're going to the other side of the lake. Well, the storm came on the lake. He was asleep. They woke him up and told him what the devil said. Yeah, they told him what the devil said. We're all going to drown here in the middle of the lake. And well, that's a paraphrase. But you see, uh, Jesus got up, and he walked up there, and he looked out in the face of that storm, and he said, Peace. But there was no peace. There was a storm on, but he called the thing that was not there. And then there was peace. Then he looked at the waves and said, Be still. But they weren't still. But then they were. They became still because he called the thing that was not. This is calling things or not. This is a Bible principle that will change your life. I promise you, you won't be bored with this uh, CD. I mean, it, today they don't put uh, cassettes in cars anymore much. So if you have a c CD player in your car, you need this. It's offer number 1215 for $15 plus $4 postage and handling. We have a toll-free order line, 1-877-396-9400. 1-877-396-9400. Until tomorrow, this is Charles Capps reminding you the enemy is defeated, God is exalted, and yes, Jesus is coming soon. To order a copy of today's show or any product offered on this program, call 1-877-396-9400 or visit our website at caps.tv where you can order downloads of our MP3 teachings, eBooks, and watch other programs on demand. This broadcast has been sponsored by Caps Ministries and is dedicated to helping you put the Word of God to work in the everyday circumstances of your life.